Today, we are joined by a very talented professional pickleball player who can frequently be seen carrying his baby brother to victory in the men's doubles division at some of the grandest stages across the country. Please welcome Colin Johns. How's it going, man? Hey, thanks for having me, Webby. This is going to be a lot of fun. We got a lot of great questions here from your fellow pro pickleball players. But before we get to those, I do have a couple questions of my own I would like to ask you. Now, most people already know that you come from a tennis background and that you were a very talented player and instructor in the tennis world. So what I want to know is, was it tough for you to make the decision to transition over and focus your efforts on pickleball? Well, it was really about the timing. So I had, uh, I'd stopped playing professional tennis, um, just a separate decision. I guess it would have been late 2018. So that kind of, uh, propelled me to go into the pickleball sphere. Like once I quit playing tennis and that was no longer my main focus, at least the playing part, I was working for my old coach. Uh, Ben said that I should really revisit this whole pickleball thing. And I was kind of skeptical. I'm like, all right, I, I'm living in Naples right now. I'll go play with Simone a couple of times. And pretty soon uh, I was hooked and I started to play a lot more. Uh, and the rest is kind of history. But it wasn't that I ever said, hey, you know what? I've had enough tennis. I'm going to play pickleball now. Um, it was just kind of really good timing. And uh, of course, the timing of pickleball exploding. It was already starting to explode, but not to the extent that it is now. We didn't have two pro tours or anything like that, not the big payouts or the TV coverage. So I never imagined it would turn into anything like this, uh, but I'm just kind of lucky I got in when it did. Now, before we get into the questions from your fellow pro players, I'm curious to know, is there a specific pickleball tournament or a victory that stands out to you as one of your favorite or the most meaningful to you so far? Hmm. I guess I could give several different answers to that, but the one that stands out, the one that I think of first would be the first time Ben and I won U.S. Open last year, in part because that was the big tournament to start out, and that's where we both started playing pickleball, uh, Naples. So U.S. Open was kind of the crown jewel of all tournaments back before there were pro tours. Um, so I watched Ben play with Kyle Yates in the final year before, and then we were going to play the next year, and of course COVID canceled the event. But that following year, uh, we won, and uh, that was really special. I had a lot of friends there, family there. And Ben and I, we saw it through and that was really special. Uh, ben had won the U.S. Open before with Kyle, but he hadn't won, a, won it with his brother. So I think it was special to both of us. And I actually put together like kind of a commemorative sort of picture frame, which is right next to me in my apartment uh, on that victory. So I think that one probably springs to mind as the first one. Nice. That's awesome. Well, I appreciate you answering some of the questions from me, but now it's time to get to the reason why you're here and why people tuned in, and that is to answer questions from your fellow pro players. And this first question comes from somebody that is basically known as the best player in the world right now, and he just so happens to be your baby brother. So here's a question from the one and only Ben Johns. What up, Siege? I got questions for you. Uh, I want you to let everybody know what sports out of all the ones you beat me at growing up did you feel like you beat me the worst at and which one do you think i had the best chance in not that i won that one either but you know if you felt any pressure at all in any game i want to hear about that one and just the one that i always lost at and you know while we're at it i think we should talk about which one i got most upset with as well <laughs> <laughs> so a throwback to our childhood yeah. So for those of you who don't know, I'm six years older than Ben and I was the older brother that would win at everything and never let my little brother win. So that's what Ben's referring to. And clearly he's beaten me on the pickleball court. Yeah. He's, I don't think I've ever beaten Ben. In fact, I know I have not. I was very close recently when I played with Annalie against him and Callie and we lost the fast breaker and he was quick to remind me of that. But I think that's fair considering that I beat him at every sport under the sun growing up uh, to answer that question. I don't know. If I can really give any one answer to that, I always enjoyed playing him and beating him at ping pong in our basement. We had a lot of fun down there, uh, but it ranged from video games to table tennis to backyard wiffle ball to games we made up on the trampoline. We played everything together. So table tennis certainly comes to mind. I think the one he had the least chance of winning at was a video game called MVP baseball 2004. And that will make them laugh because it is very specific, but I'm convinced I'm the best player on the planet earth of that game. And I would literally spot Ben leads and give him the best teams. And he had no chance of winning. 
I was just too good at that one. And he pretty quickly beat me at golf. So I don't know if that's even a good answer for him. Uh, but yeah, he's always been a better golfer than me. Uh, so he, he pretty quickly surpassed me in that after he was strong enough to hit the ball, even oh, slightly far. So <laughs> I guess I'll give him uh, those answers on all those questions he posed. This next question comes from one of the most dominant female players in the whole world right now. Here is a question from Anna Lee Waters. All right, Colin, I know your favorite shot is the pancakes, so I was wondering if you like to eat pancakes as much as you like to give them. (laughs) Oh, baby Waters delivers. I'm not surprised that part of her question (laughs) involves food, (laughs) considering the foodie that she is. And that's why her and Ben make such a good partnership, because they both love food. Uh, So to answer her question, I have been working on my version of the pancake, which I also call the stop sign. Some people are calling it the scorpion, but you know, the, the one where you put the the paddle basically vertical and and punch, uh, she's referring to that. I did get her, I think four times in one game with it in our last practice session, I'm going to throw that out there. So baby waters doesn't like my pancake or stop sign. And to answer your real question, do I like to eat pancakes? I am more partial to French toast than I am to pancakes, but I will certainly not pass up on a good stack of pancakes in LA. And I'm sure that we can find a good place at some point after a tournament, not before, um, definitely after you win your singles um, before, definitely not a good idea, speaking from experience, uh, at least when it comes to a tennis court, uh, we will definitely enjoy some pancakes with lots of syrup and lots of butter. Nice. Thanks for the question, Anna Lee. This next question comes from a great player and commentator who you can frequently see and hear during PPA broadcasts. Here is a question from Dave Fleming. What's happening? Colin, Dave Fleming here. And my question for you is what advice would you give rec players who love to watch you and your fellow pros play on the streams, on TV? What can they learn from watching? What would you tell them to do? What would you tell them to look for? And what would you tell them that they can take and then try to replicate when they go out and hit the courts themselves? See you soon, brother. Well, that's a good question from a good buddy of mine. I had the pleasure of commentating with Dave recently at TOC for the mix final. We always uh, get along great. So that's a good question. It's definitely a commentator question. There are a lot of amateurs out there that watch the pro matches both live and on the live stream. Uh, so definitely enjoy this question. I would say there are some things that amateur players see the pros do that they really like to focus on uh, the fancier shots. So the pretty rollers or the Ernie's or the ATPs, which is great. But I think the pros above all else do the fundamentals really well. So take a look at the court positioning of the pros. If they hit a good shot, they're going to take advantage of that good shot by positioning themselves in the best possible position. In the same way, they're also going to take a step back and put themselves in the best defensive position when they hit a bad shot. Um, So how teams move together, especially teams that play a lot together, I think you can gain a lot from their court positioning. And sure, I mean, maybe Ben moves better than your average direct player. I'm sure he does. But at the same time, there are parallels you can draw with something as simple as court positioning. Um, So I would say that would be the number one thing I would think of. And just the foundation. Uh, it's, It's all about the shot selection. Uh, the core positioning. If you have that down, we might be able to do fun stuff with the ball, but you can implement a lot of those same fun shots in your own way against the players you play against if you have good, solid fundamentals. Nice. That is great stuff. Great question there, Dave. Thank you for that. This next question comes from our good friend and Sick Tricks member, Joey Farias. Hey, Colin. Um, I got two good questions for you this week. We won't go with who hits you harder, Pat Smith or Martina Coakley, but the standard one will be, what was your favorite meal we had in Portugal? And the second one will be, how do I stop hitting into that damn stop sign of yours on the forehand side? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, those are two fantastic questions. And I should say before that we had an amazing trip to Portugal, pickleball getaways trip. Joey was one of the other pros and he was there with his wife, Tony. I took the tour to Tony in Portugal. She knew everywhere to go, everywhere to eat. So we had so much fun over there, uh, all of us. So the first question on our favorite meal, I think we probably both liked the same meal. I think it was that first meal that we had, which was downtown Lisbon. And it was a sort of ceviche with octopus, I want to say. And it was 
unbelievable. The octopus in Portugal, the whole trip was just amazing. So I, I got to say that was, that was my most, uh, my favorite meal on that trip. And thinking about the stop sign question, uh, you just got to be better, Joey. You, you got to do better. Um, you got to find the, the weak point. It exists. Um, otherwise, everyone would have a stop sign. And uh, I still think you have one of the, the best forehand flicks in the game. You just uh, don't play as much as you did. So we want to get you back out there and have you uh, flicking from that, that white star at the Texas Open like you did against Ben years ago, which uh, Joey will get that reference, but uh, that's sort of uh, an inside joke on the Texas Open when they painted the, the court white in certain areas and you could hide your shot from that particular area. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Thanks for the question, Joey. This next question comes from a great friend of ours, and she was also my recent mixed doubles partner at the Beer City Open exhibition match. Here's a question from the one and only Irina Tereshenko. CJ, hi friend. This is Irina. How are you doing? What's up, Eddie and Webby? CJ, really looking forward to playing a couple of mixed tournaments with you coming up on the PPA Tour. Let's, let's get it done. And uh, I have two questions for you. Number one, what is the biggest gift Pickleball has given you? And number two, do you have any superstitions leading into the matches and tournaments? Or maybe even at home? <laughs> Irina, original as always, one of our <laughs> biggest characters in the game and one of the first people I met when I first started playing Pickleball. <laughs> So let's start with the superstitions. Not to disappoint, I don't really have any superstitions. I, I guess superstitions would be the wrong word for it. I do, I'm a big fan of routine. So before any match, I'm going to get warmed up, um, make sure that you respect your body and make sure you get loose, um, try to eat a good meal before. So kind of my tennis habits die hard in that. So I wouldn't say they're a superstition, but it's certainly something that I like to attend to. And what was the other one? What is the biggest gift pickleball has given you? Oh, the, the biggest gift. That's right. I think getting to, to play a sport with Ben. Uh, so Ben grew up playing everything that I did. And we were too far apart in age to really play doubles together in tennis. Uh, I was always so much older and better than him that I think we tried at one time. But yeah, he was just too young. Um, so we never thought we would get the opportunity to play a sport where we could literally compete at the highest level. And pickleball has definitely given me that opportunity. And also given the fact that our sister gets to interview us after matches, I think that pickleball making it a, a family affair is probably the biggest gift that pickleball has given me. It's a good question. Nice. Yeah, that was a good question. And yeah, I agree. That's so cool that you get to play with your brother, get interviewed by your sister after matches and victories and stuff like that. That, that is very cool. Not many sports out there like that, especially at the pro level that you get to experience something like that. I love it. This next question comes from somebody that Colin knows very well and is a very popular content creator that was also recently on our podcast. Here is a question from Sydney Steinecker. So my question to you is what drills would you recommend for people that have terrible overheads, aka me? Yeah, I need help with that. <laughs> this uh, interview wouldn't be complete without a question from the girlfriend. Also, <laughs> bringing up the fact that I lob her every time I play with her because <laughs> she has no overhead. Uh, well, I think a, a personal lesson with Colin Johns could solve all your issues, but you know, you just haven't asked me. Um, I think she asked me today, finally, knowing that her, her weakness cannot be solved any other way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> good, good drills to do, in all honesty, would be... If you're not a tennis player, you got to really learn how to release your elbow and pronate. So a lot of people make the mistake of keeping their arms straight and locked. So you can really only get so much power if you do that. So if you can just unlock that elbow and snap the elbow and actually get some, some speed with your, your swing speed, that's going to help your overhead a lot. And that's one of the first steps to actually getting some power on it. And that all goes with, of course, turning, getting your shoulders and, and hips into it, getting the right position to strike the ball so it's a little bit in front. There are a lot of things that go into striking good overhead. Uh, the tennis players have it pretty easy because we're so used to hitting tennis overheads. Uh, and then the last thing is make sure you don't hit it into the ground, which is a common mistake that tennis players make, where in tennis you can bounce it over the back fence. In pickleball, obviously, all the energy is just lost into the ground and it pops right up for your opponents to return. So you got to hit them more linearly in pickleball. So... All that being said, um, definitely need to practice your overhead, sweetheart. 
Well, I will definitely be taking note because I am. I feel like I fit in the same category that Sydney does. I definitely need to work on my overheads, so I will be taking note of what you just said. Thank you for that. <laughs> and now we have a series of questions from an awesome player who is also known for being a great mental performance coach. Here are some questions from Dane Gingrich. CJ, what's up, buddy? All right, I, I got a two-part, a serious, not a screw around question, a serious two-part question on transition. Talk about. When the player not hitting the third drop, just the third drop, talk about the player not hitting the third drop and his or her role moving towards the kitchen, right? Versus the old school way of just hit a third drop, sprint to the line. Should I move slowly? Should I wait for a specific shot and crash? What do you teach? How do you teach? What do you think as a player? And now part two, when, if ever, should we be counterattacking from that transition? All right. This uh, definitely lives up to Dane. It's very detailed, very Dane. So <laughs> I appreciate the question. And it's actually a great question because a lot of amateurs get this wrong. This is one of the, the main things I cover in a lot of my clinics or lessons. And it's the cadence of the partner, the one not hitting the third, whether they're driving or dropping. Um, but I think his question mentioned dropping. So we'll take that case. For the partner, this is really, really important because a lot of people do one of the two extremes. So they either watch their partner hit and they're basically in line with their partner. Let's assume the return went relatively deep and they kind of turn and watch their partner hit. The problem with that is if they hit a good third, it's kind of too late. They can get in a couple steps, but you kind of missed your opportunity and certainly missed your opportunity to, to try to poach or do anything offensive. The other end of the spectrum would be to sprint all the way to the kitchen line. And then your partner hangs you out to dry every once in a while and you get it smashed down your throat. So you don't want to do either one of those things. And as good as the pros thirds are, if you watch closely, most of the time we're not going in all the way because the players that we play against, they have great reach. They've got great roles and great power. So even if you float the third a little bit, you can pay a pretty hefty price if you're in too far. So specifically, you want to be usually two steps ahead of your partner. An important part of that is looking over your shoulder at your partner's third, whether to drive or drop, to see if it's going to do damage or not. So if it's a good drop, you want to keep coming. And this is another important thing to note is you want to squeeze the middle a little bit. If it's a very good third, especially, a lot of times you can get a quick, easy point on the fifth. But let's say it's pretty good. You need to be leaning middle to shrink the court for your opponents because it can be very hard for them to play it behind you if it's a good third you kind of take away the middle and you force them to hit to a smaller sliver of court. And then your partner has a much easier fifth if they are indeed the person taking the fifth. So that's in best case scenario. Now, if they hit a mediocre third, usually you can kind of hold your ground in mid court if you have confidence in your mid court game. And I know Dane is a big proponent of practicing mid court. Uh, so you can definitely hold your ground. You don't have to immediately retreat if it's mediocre. And of course, if it's really bad, if they're about to point blank you with an overhead, you have plenty of time to then take a couple steps back and play some defense. So you get the best of both worlds. You can be offensive, you can be defensive and everywhere in between. Um, so that's part one of the question. Um, part two was when, if ever, would you attack from the transition zone? This is something I would say you see most commonly at the four or five level and why a lot of people get stuck at four or five because they fall in love with power and power is great. But if you use power at the wrong times in pickleball, you can pay a hefty price and at four or five, people's hands generally get pretty good. And they might have as much or more power than you do. And you see this nice juicy ball in the transition zone, and you just want to wail away at it, even though it's, it's waist height. The problem with that is there's a lot of space in front of you when you're in the transition zone. So even if you're closing fast, if they get the ball down with their volley on the second one, uh, the one after they hit it at you in the transition zone, you're going to be in big trouble because you're going to be hitting up and they're going to be hitting down. Uh, so that's why you wouldn't want to play that shot. And the alternative is just better. I mean, you could block put it in the kitchen, give yourself plenty of time to get into the kitchen line and get to at least neutral. Uh, so that's why you would want to do that. The only time you would really want to deviate from that, in my mind, is if you can hit down on your opponents when you're in transition. So if they gave you a ball high enough to where you can get a downward trajectory on the ball and certainly also help to have a lot of power, if you got uh, the power of Deckel Bar, the Israeli demigod, then maybe you can swing away a little bit more. But you have to have the ball high enough to where you can hit slightly down. It doesn't have to be all the way down, but slightly down so that your opponents will then have to hit up. Otherwise you really have no business attacking in transition because you will eventually play players that have good enough hands to get the ball down at your feet. And you're just going to lose that way too much of the time. 
Uh, so you see a lot of schools of thought in transition. I think it's one of the most important areas of the game and one that's misunderstood in a lot of ways. So I appreciate those two questions from Mr. Dane Gingrich. Man, those were some great questions from Dane. Great answers there, Colin. And Dane actually gave me another question to choose from. And I liked all the questions that he sent me so much that I couldn't choose just one of them. So I wanted to play all of them. So here is the third and final question from Dane Gingrich. All right, I want to ask about your post-tournament breakdown and film sessions. What exactly are you looking for um, during those film sessions in your breakdown? What stats do you believe hold the most ROI, hold the most importance for your next tournament moving forward? How do you break it down? How often do you look at your film post-tournament and exactly what you're looking for? Uh Uh-huh, so Dane's trying to get inside uh, the secret vault <laughs> right? <laughs> a little bit. Um, he definitely knows that I study film. I'm one of the players that do. And I think a lot can be learned from it, especially now that we have good vantage points. The cameras are only getting better. So you can learn a lot. You can learn about other players' tendencies. You can see what you might do well yourself, what you don't do so well. And then taking from that statistics, uh, that's something that I've been doing for some time, and I feel like that gives you a good return on investment for practicing. So, for example, if you find, uh, and this is one way to chart it, that you're missing at a specific part of the court in a specific way. So I typically will break up the court into three different areas, baseline, transition, and kitchen line. And then in each of those categories, I'm going to have soft shot or hard shot, meaning you receive something that was hit hard or hit soft. So if you're up at the kitchen line and you've hit and the, you've received something soft, that would be a dink uh, versus something like a speed up would be hard at the kitchen line. So essentially you have six categories. And what you'll find is usually most of your errors are going to take place in one or two of those categories. And once you can diagnose what those categories are, let's say it's somebody who has a weak third shot, it's going to be you could call a return a hard shot, depends on how hard they're returning. A hard shot from the baseline, they're making a lot of errors on those. So your best return on investment for something like that would be to practice a bunch of thirds, whether it's drives or drops, so that you're not giving away so many points to the opponents. Of course, it's relevant how good the opponents are, how good their specific shots are. Uh, all that has to be taken into account. But I feel like one of the best things about taking statistics is you can find stuff that you wouldn't otherwise recognize. And pro matches definitely are a really good example of that because certain teams will be winning or losing in game one, and then they'll turn it around in game two, and nobody can really figure out why. Oh, well, maybe one player played better. But if you look below the surface a little bit, you can see, oh, they stopped countering so much, and maybe they blocked a little bit more at the kitchen line, and they were more consistent because of that. Something like that can turn the tide of a match. And unless you're really digging into the hard numbers, I don't think you're going to really, really understand why you're winning and losing. So not to give everything away to Dane, uh, that would be something pretty much anybody can do. It's not all that hard. There aren't that many shots in the match uh, if you're just looking at one player. And it, even if you do it by hand, if you don't have a system to it, it can take you 30 minutes to go through uh, a two or three game match. So something pr- really anybody can do. And one more bonus category that I really like Uh, that's not out there. And there is a really good page by Jim Ramsey. I'm sure some people have seen it on Facebook, a pro pickleball stats. And he has third shot on there and he separates it by who's receiving the third shots and what they decide to do with it. So typically that's going to be a driver drop. Um, The other stat that I would like to see in that category is whether you were successful with that. So we're taking drops and I think he, he notes whether you missed the drop or not. But let's say you hang the drop a little bit and three shots later, you lose the point because of it. That's not really a successful drop. I would like to know how successful that third is. Are you able to establish the kitchen line? And in my mind, that's a success uh, where you get to neutral or you put yourself in a winning position. So your partner hits a beautiful third shot drop. um, They pop up the ball and your partner hits the fifth in the net. I think that's still a success for your team because you're going to win that more often than not or if you both established the line versus anything other than that would fall into the category of a failure. So if you're getting into the line a higher percentage of the time than the opposing team, you're giving yourself more bites at the apple, which is highly relevant. And maybe they're better at the line than you are, but you're getting in every time and they're not, you're going to win the match. So that's a stat that I would love to see kept and you can certainly chart yourself. 
of all the pros asking pros questions segments that we've done, this is definitely the most knowledgeable one, something we can learn something from. I know I'm going to be rewatching this episode numerous times to take notes <laughs> of all this information. That was great stuff. Uh, we're not done yet. This next question comes from a very dominant player and a longtime friend of ours. Here is a question from the one and only Lucy Kovalova. Hi, Colin. I'm sure you received a lot of pickable questions. So I have a little different question for you. How does a perfect date look like for Colin Johns? Bye, guys. <laughs> Lucy, throw in the curveball. Uh, when she comes on, I'm going to make sure to ask her what that looks like for her and Matt. Because uh, <laughs> yeah. Lucy doesn't eat after a certain time, for those of you who don't know. And that makes dinner dates very difficult for Matt. So if he <laughs> wants to go to dinner with Lucy, he knows Lucy's not going to eat anything. So I'm going to bring that question right back at her. <laughs> uh, to answer that, uh, I like a lot of different things, but typically I like it to be in a more intimate environment. I don't necessarily love to, say, go to a concert with uh, my girlfriend uh, where there are a lot of other people around. I like it to be more one-on-one -on -one, or it can be a double date or, or something like that. Um, a nice dinner and then walking around afterwards in a cool city. So having moved to Austin in January, uh, we've been taking advantage of that. We had dinner the other night downtown and we just walked around the city afterwards and if there's music or a festival. Uh, Austin has a lot of that. I just enjoy just kind of casually walking around, spend some one-on-one -on -one time. And we've actually uh, just cooked in and, and watched a movie a couple nights this week. So typically it's pretty low key. Uh, I don't like to do anything too, too exciting, but that's kind of Colin's perfect day. Nice. Nice. This next question is a very important one that everybody wants to know the answer to. And this comes from one of the best female players in the entire world. And that is our good friend, Catherine Parento. Hey, Colin, I have a question for you. What is your favorite ice cream shop? And what is your favorite flavor? I look forward to playing with you in Cincinnati. Let's go. <laughs> Indeed, my doubles partner, mixed doubles partner for Cincinnati. Looking forward to that. We had a lot of success in Orange County. Didn't have the TOC we wanted, and we're going to get back at it in Cincinnati. And another food question. So I think Anna Lee has rubbed off. The waters have definitely rubbed off on <laughs> Catherine when it comes to asking food questions. Uh, I guess Catherine likes ice cream as much as Anna Lee. Uh, Hannah, actually, my sister, used to work at Cold Stone Creamery. So I do have a soft spot for Colston Creamery. I typically get birthday cake remix there. Um, that's uh, pretty exciting with brownies and sprinkles and cake batter and all sorts of fair and healthy, nice things to eat. <laughs> oh yeah. So <laughs> I guess I'm going to go with that as my answer. Colston Creamery birthday cake remix. Nice salad choice. I do enjoy eating that flavor myself. This next question comes from a great player and friend of ours, and that is the lovely and talented Martina Coakley. Hi, CJ. This is Martina. Um, how are you? I actually have a scenario for you, not a question. Um, so pretend that you're in a foreign country and there's your favorite restaurant with the best pizza on the top of the hill. You are absolutely starving and you have a couple options to get there and you are on a time crunch. Um, so option number one is you walk. Option number two, you run. Option number three, you take a scooter. And option number four, you take an Uber. Now, can you please explain why would you take a certain uh, either form of transportation or you choose to walk? <laughs> I think she wins the award for the most unique question. <laughs> oh, well, most unique question. I got to get a little background on this and why she would ask this. because She was also one of the pros in Portugal. And we had gone out to dinner one night. It was me, Joey, her, and Tony. And I think it was a pizza place that we went to. I can't remember if we ended up going there or not, but they were closing relatively soon. We needed to get there quickly and we were kind of far away. And I'm a little bashful about wanting to get on one of those little motorized scooters. You know, the ones where you kind of use your Uber app to get on them. We have a bunch of them in Austin. And I just think they're so dangerous considering that you use them on the road a lot. And if a car doesn't see you, that could be very bad for you. So I'm a little leery of getting on these things. And I'm also leery of going kind of fast. I was never really into skateboarding. Uh, I don't really want to bite the dust on uh, one of those scooters. So I would say no to the scooters. She did get me on one and I went very slowly to that restaurant that we wanted to go to that night. 
And uh, they all made fun of me. I think Tony went in circles around me as I went to the restaurant. Uh, so <laughs> that's where this question comes from. <laughs> I'd much rather take the Uber or walk. Running seems a little excessive unless it's an emergency, but you got to do what you got to do. If it's my favorite pizza place and they're about to close, I got to find a way to get there. So if I have to run, I will do it. Nice. <laughs> Thank you very much, Martina. This next one is going to be the final question of the day, and it comes from another extremely talented pro player in the wonderful world of pickleball, and that is the one and only AJ Kohler. Siege. So we all know that the algorithm runs on whole milk, but I want to know what are the three things that make the algorithm malfunction? See you, buddy. <laughs> oh yeah, you got to get to know me a little bit better to uh, <laughs> to fully understand where this question comes from. <laughs> uh, well, there's sort of uh, what I call the algorithm with, which runs Colin's life. It's just basically my methods and systems of doing things. I'm kind of meticulous and organized and it's not a real thing. I'm not a robot, but uh, I have my system of doing things, AKA the algorithm and it is powered by whole milk. That is indeed true. And I guess this question is what makes it malfunction? I mean, I'm not going to give that away. That, that, that would be, that would be catastrophic. I mean, it runs on ones and zeros. It's impossible to shut it down. It just <laughs> runs and runs. Uh, well, getting hit in the head on the pickleball court generally makes the algorithm at least have to reboot. Usually I have to call a, a timeout and throw my hat or something. Um, ask Jay Villiers and Pat Smith about that. Um, they'll laugh. Uh, but <laughs> I can't give away what, how the algorithm would, would crash. That would just completely ruin everything. Uh, that would be my demise. Uh, but I will have to think about that. And if there are any ways to get it to crash, I will have to shore up those weaknesses uh, to make sure that never happens. Nice. Yeah. When I got that question from AJ, I was like, there's, there's gotta be some kind of inside joke here. I, I'm very <laughs> interested to hear Colin's answer to this. So <laughs> yeah, definitely uh, some inside baseball there, but uh, that's my <laughs> best explanation. On that. Nice. Well, Colin, thank you very much. This was awesome. It was great to learn a little bit more about your background, but also a great opportunity for us to learn from you because I mean, we got some great information, some great strategy ideas. So I definitely appreciate that very much. If you like this type of content and want us to keep doing it, please let us know. Feel free to subscribe to our channel. And then if you want to let us know any other pros that you would like to see featured in a future episode, leave us a comment down below. But that's going to do it for us here today. And until next time, this is Wabby, not Eddie, signing off. Pickleball addicting and fun, that's no joke. Pickleball and it's not just for old folks. Pickleball. 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 Pickleball.